Tonight on KQED Newsroom, we speak with San Francisco Mayor London Breed about the state of the city and how she's tackling the biggest problems, homelessness, housing and economic development in the year ahead. Also, we take a look at national politics and the legacy of Congress member Jackie Speer, who's retiring from office. We discuss her long career in public service, what she's most proud of, what she would change and what comes next. Plus, it's that most wonderful time of the year, and holiday lights twinkle with cheer in these dark winter nights in tonight's Something Beautiful. Coming to you from KQED headquarters in San Francisco, this Friday, December 9th, 2022. Hello and welcome to the show. This is KQED Newsroom, and I'm Priya David Clemens. San Francisco Mayor London Breed has been in office for almost five years now. Her tenure has been marked by homelessness and crime, problems that are not uncommon throughout the state, but are seen very significantly here. Mayor Breed has called for a more hardline approach to addressing these issues while continuing to encourage compassion. Mayor London Breed joins me now. Thank you for being here. Of course. So you've been in office for a little more than four years now. Mm -hmm. You know this city inside and out? Oh, yes. <laughs> Tell us, where do we stand? What's the good, bad, and the ugly? Yeah, well, the good news is that we're finally coming out of this pandemic and we're starting to see our city come back. Um, we've hosted a number of conventions, including Dreamforce, and they were huge successes over the past year. Uh, we're seeing Moscone Center book up. Tourists are coming back to our hotels. We're at 60% capacity with our hotels. Uh, we were at 80% pre-pandemic, so things are starting to look up and businesses are starting to invest in it again. And so I'm really excited about the future. The energy and the air feels different. I mean, of course, any major city would have problems. We have, you know, s real challenges around drug use and homelessness and crime. Uh, but at the end of the day, we are tackling those things aggressively. And I think that a new day is on the horizon. I think, you know, every city deserves to have a booster in its mayor, right? You yes. want to be saying, like, here's <laughs> the great stuff that's on the horizon. Yes. And, and to that point, as you're talking about tur uh, tourism, it's expected to double next year yes. after many years of problems with tourism in San Francisco. And that's going to not only be great for our hotels, it's going to be great for our restaurants, for retail, for our neighborhoods. I mean, San Francisco is a beautiful place. People say it time and time again. It is just picture perfect in terms of the views and the new parks and open space and all the great amenities that we have to offer our museums. So it's going to really make a difference when people start to come back. Um, we have a number of conventions. We're booking up like crazy, as I said, at Moscone Center, a number of conventions scheduled. And so oftentimes those people expand their trips to include some time around the city, and we're looking forward to it. But we still do have problems in the city, and that has depressed tourism in the past. It has discouraged people from coming here. Conferences have said they're not going to come back to San Francisco because of issues with crime and homelessness. Mm -hmm. You have been a big advocate for changing some of the problems that we've had, for mm -hmm. working on these social ills from the moment that you stepped yes. into office, right? And so just a year ago, you made a very big statement. Mm -hmm. well, we're going to take another look at that, where you really called out the problems that we're facing yes. here. Yes. And it was important to do so because the fact is, unfortunately, um, we have a, a lot of problems. And I understand the need for criminal justice reform and being empathetic to the fact that people struggle with addiction. But we also have to think about the victims who fall uh, as, as prey to many of these crimes. And we have to also think about the conditions of our streets and our city. We have to balance all of that and to just allow it to happen because um, there are challenges that exist. Or it's just not acceptable. All right, well, let's listen to what you had to say last year and then come back and talk about it. And it's time that the reign of criminals who are destroying our city, it is time for it to come to an end. And it comes to an end when we take the steps to be more aggressive with law enforcement, more aggressive with the changes in our policies, and less tolerant of all the bullshit that has destroyed our city. So at that time, you declared a state of emergency in the Tenderloin, you increased police patrols, and you eventually opened the Tenderloin Center. And then that center closed this week. 
Critics are unhappy with a couple of things. They say, one, it didn't serve as many people as it should have, and two, it closed before something new was in its place to help provide services. How do you respond to that? How do you deal with these ongoing problems? Because we are still seeing crime and homelessness, despite the many years you've been tackling this and pushing yes. towards change. Well, many of those same critics are the people who actually oppose what we were trying to do with the declaration of emergency and the tenderloin in the first place. Uh, and the fact is, this Linkage Center, because we have so many programs, the city spends uh, over the past two years a billion dollars to help address homelessness, which not only includes housing, it includes supportive services and the kinds of things that are supposed to help people uh, in particular uh, that are struggling with addiction. Mm. The Linkage Center was supposed to be this place that we brought together a lot of the resources of the programs that are helping to serve um, this population and provide opportunities for people to get help, to get treatment, to transition, to, to get services. And time and time again, uh, unfortunately, from so many people who use the Linkage Center as a place to look for help, I have heard numerous stories of the fact that that help wasn't happening. That was my frustration. And what I said from the very beginning, I don't think there's anything wrong with trying something new, um, seeing if it works, and if it doesn't work, figuring out something else to do. And, and to talk about something new in its place, I mean, this is what we fund all these other programs to do. Like we have programs all over the city with treatment on demand and a number of support su sources that many of these people should have been referred to or taken to mm -hmm. and that just wasn't happening at the capacity that it should have, um, which is why we have had, we had to make the hard decision to go in a different direction, but it doesn't mean that we're not still providing those services in San Francisco. They're just not at this particular location. Where's the rub, Mayor Breed? It seems like the city for many years, with a compassionate heart, has been funneling money into programs and services to help people mm -hmm. um, through the problems of you know, substance abuse, through the open air drug dealing issues that we have. But it doesn't seem like we're making a lot of progress. Tell me if you think I'm wrong yeah. on that. But where do you think the problem is? Well, it's, it's hard to pinpoint the problem. I will say that you know, over the past two years, We've created over 5,000 new permanent places in our shelter system and in permanent supportive housing. And when you think about it, we only saw a 15% reduction in shelter homelessness. Uh, we had a little bit over 8,000 people who were homeless in the city. So and 5,000 new beds, 8,000 homeless people, 5,000 bed, new think, beds. You would think. It should help. And all of those beds are now full? It's being used? For the most part, yes. So does that mean more homeless people are coming to San Francisco? I, I think that it's complicated in that we, we, I'm sure, have people who are coming to San Francisco uh, for various reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I'm actually meeting some of those people and they're telling me that they've been here for six months or for nine months or for two years um, from all parts of the country. And I don't necessarily think that that is the only problem. I think that is definitely part of the problem. Um, because again, it goes back to the challenges around addiction and unfortunately the ease at which people are able to access drugs on our streets. And that's what we need to focus our time and attention on is addressing the open air drug dealing um, that has just really been very much problematic um, and has led to, I think, you know, skyrocketing numbers of people um, who are homeless in San Francisco. We also have the other side of that coin, which is the lack of housing. Mm -hmm. And you've advocated for a program recently called Cars to Casas, in which it would allow developers to build high density housing on parking lots, former gas stations, yes. you know, that can deliver some housing. Talk to us about the housing need in San Francisco, yes. maybe how much will come from this program, but what the need is overall. Yes, the need is great. We have just, over the years, we have not built housing, period. And we wonder why, especially people like me and my friends, we grow up in San Francisco and things get more and more expensive mm -hmm. and people have to leave San Francisco, the place that they love. And folks who are trying to come here for an opportunity can't necessarily always afford to live here. So I think that, you know, we failed in producing enough housing. Our policies have made it almost virtually impossible to even build what we committed to do, mm -hmm. which is 5,000 units a year. Um, but I'm hopeful because just recently the governor in the state has required us to pass uh, this uh, legislation around a housing element. We're required to build 
82,000 units in the next eight years. And the only way we're going to be able to get there is changes to our policies. You recently drew the ire of the world's wealthiest man and San Francisco's most recent and notorious business owner, Elon Musk. He took aim at you in a tweet recently after the city investigated if beds are being placed illegally inside Twitter headquarters. He wrote, so city of San Francisco attacks companies providing beds for tired employees instead of making sure kids are safe from fentanyl. Where are your priorities, London breed? What do you think? of this tweet? Is the man right? Are your priorities in the wrong place? Or is this the right thing that should be happening right now? Well, the fact is, you know, there was a report made and an investigation done. And it's unfortunate that, you know, that time is even being spent on talking about this. I don't think there's anything wrong um, with working with his company to try and provide uh, the appropriate regulations around how we deal with buildings and what is and is a, isn't appropriate to do in buildings and, and necessary permits if it's something that he wants to do. Um, you know, we've worked with previous owners of Twitter in the past. Um, they've gotten a lot of tax breaks, a lot of support uh, from the city, so we're not opposed to working with companies. Um, but I, I, I don't think it's a, a good idea to kind of make demands and try to push an agenda via Twitter. That's just, that's, that's a way to not get anywhere. Uh, we're both adults and it's important that we just come together to try and figure out solutions. But when people make complaints, unfortunately, we have the responsibility, whether we agree with them or not, to respond and that's what we did. And then last, this week, you spent some time at the Transamerica building, and yes. it has been 50 years now since that first opened. Tell us about the investment going into that area. Well, what's interesting about the Transamerican building is it's, it's so iconic, and it, it really is a symbol of San Francisco. And the fact that, you know, not only uh, is there going to be a significant investment in um, the building itself and, and making it a, a different kind of place for people to work in. Also the surrounding area, the Redwood Park and the plaza and other areas that aren't typically visited by anyone because it's not that kind of area. And I think that, you know, with the restaurants and all the great things that are going to happen, it's going to make it a fun place to be on not just the weekdays, but the weekends. And so I'm really excited about uh, what this is going to do for San Francisco. It's going to make uh, downtown more attractive during uh, the weekends as well. And so I can't wait. It, it was really a great event, us uh, celebrating, um, you know, this historic building, but more importantly, uh, the investments that are being made to make it just really a San Francisco treasure. So we're looking forward to that and it'll be available to the entire public to enjoy. San Francisco's Mayor London Breed, thank you for being here. Thank you. California Congress member Jackie Speer was born in San Francisco. She entered the limelight when she survived being shot five times at Jonestown when she was just 28 years old. She later served on the Board of Supervisors in San Mateo County and in the California State Assembly and Senate. In 2008, Jackie Speer was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives. Last year, she announced that she would not seek re-election. So what's next for the Congress member and just what is her political legacy? Joining me now is California Congress member Jackie Speer here in studio with me. Thank you for being here. I'm delighted to be with you. So are you still going back to D.C.? Is there still work to be done before oh, yes. your term ends? We will be in session for at least the next two weeks. OK, so you've still got a little time. Yes. there. And will they throw a big party for you when you're, you know, no, they don't up? throw parties for you. <laughs> They, they kind of kick you to the curb ever so gently. <laughs> Here's the door. Thank you very much for your service. Right. I had to move out of my office um, on the 28th of November. And so now I'm you know, kind of couch surfing from office to office. And 15 minutes after I was moved out of my office, they came with my nameplate and said, do you want this? <laughs> wow. They're ready. They're ready for the next crop. That's right. We got to well, move on. You know what? Everything does have its time. Everything does have its season. This is your time to be stepping down, making way for new lawmakers. Tell me about the challenges that you see the new crop of lawmakers facing in D.C. and maybe how it differs from what the political climate was like, what the problems you were facing were when you entered in 2008. Well, when I entered in 2008, we were in the majority for two years and then in the minority for eight years and then 
uh, we got back into the majority. So the new members are going to have to deal with what is a pretty toxic environment, I'm afraid to say. Mm. There's a real interest by the Republicans to uh, investigate issues that are really unrelated to the operation of government. Hunter Biden is not someone doing business with the government, and yet they want to put a lot of stock into investigating his relationship with foreign governments and the like. And I think that it's going to prevent us from moving forward. Now, I will say in the last two years, it's probably been the most productive Congress uh, oh. in recent time certainly in the time that I've been in Congress, when you look at all the legislation that has been passed around infrastructure, around semiconductors and the chip industry, um, around marriage equality, around the COVID recovery, when you think of all that we've done, it's been pretty profound. So just recently, the Respect for Marriage Act was passed. Does that point to the possibility of more bipartisanship for both parties coming together and working to pass legislation that's helpful for America? Well, I would hope so, but I think the agenda of my colleagues who will be in the majority, the Republicans, is a different agenda. I mean, they want to probably cut taxes again, um, and they may want to um, up the military spending, even though we actually put $45 billion more into the National Defense Authorization Act just yesterday uh, than the president had requested. So it's going to be different. Their priorities are different. They want to out trans members in the military. Um, I had a hearing on that issue and we saw how profound their contributions are and why would we want to do that? Cutting taxes, raising more funding for the military, those have been long been Republican planks. But I'm curious about the culture that you're talking about right now. You were there at the Capitol when the January 6th riots happened just about a year ago. Have we stepped back from the brink of that sort of bitter partisan divide, or do you think that could happen again? Let's hope to God that doesn't happen again. I mean, there has to be a concerted effort by my colleagues in Congress, in both houses of both parties, to tamp down the rhetoric. But it's really difficult when you go on Twitter and when you post something positive, you get no likes. When you post something outrageous, you get many likes. Mm -hmm. And then members, some members, actually fundraise off of that. So when you had someone radicalized enough on the social media to go into the Pelosi house and bludgeon mm -hmm. the speaker's husband. I mean, that should cause all of us to stand back and realize that words matter. And I'm hopeful that they're gonna take that lesson. Well, when it comes to social media, we certainly don't think that the discourse is getting any better on there. And in fact, with Elon Musk taking over Twitter, there are even more concerns now. Do you share those concerns? Have you done work around these issues? Well, I do have concerns about it. I've seen a reduction in a number of followers by 10,000 just since he uh, became the owner of Twitter. For your own social media account. That's right. So, and I, I'm sure it's happened to, to all members as well. Uh, what's the alternative? And that's what will be, I think, the challenge for, for members as they move forward. Uh, I think that he needs to recognize that his platform is part is like a utility now. We have got to regulate um, them like utilities so that uh, there isn't the kind of toxic rhetoric and there isn't falsehoods that continue to be promoted. I want to go back and talk about the beginning of your career, which was pretty explosive. You started in the late 70s, and in 1979, you went down to Guyana and South America with the Congress member you were working for at the time, Leo Ryan, and you were investigating the People's Temple and Jim Jones, which was a cult, and subsequently 900 people died by murder-suicide down there. But while you were down there, members of Jim Jones' militia shot you five times. You lay there for 22 hours without medical help. And you somehow emerged from that saying, I'm going to devote my life to public service. Instead of deciding to run away from it, you ran towards it. Why was that? I didn't want to spend the rest of my life being dubbed a, a Jonestown survivor. 
and I had worked in public uh, service. I had worked for the congressman. And so I literally came home after two months of hospitalization and 10 surgeries, and over that last weekend decided I'm going to run for his seat. And I ran for a seat and lost, um, and then pursued a career in public service, first in the uh, Board of Supervisors and then in the state legislature. You did lose that seat. You eventually won the seat, obviously. But you've also faced other losses in your life, and you write about these in your book, Undaunted. And you talk about loss of your husband, your first husband. You talk about how you had complications with a pregnancy that led to an abortion. Tell us about how those losses have made you the human being who's sitting here today. Well, when you, when you endure those kinds of losses or that kind of trauma, um, it does shape you. And certainly the trauma of Jonestown uh, made me somewhat fearless because once you've looked death in the eye, you're not as afraid anymore. When I lost my husband and I was pregnant with our second child, it was the lowest point in my life. I did not want to move on. Um, but I had a very strong-willed Germanic father who said, Jackie, it's been three months since Steve died. Get over it. Wow. And then I realized, um, you know, we all are... Our, we all have a certain amount of trauma and disappointment in life, and the test is whether or not we can put it behind us and move forward. And so it's just been a guiding principle for me, and it's allowed me to take on issues that maybe I wouldn't have taken on, but for the fact that uh, I have this fearless element in my being now that allows me to, to go where I might not have gone before. It sort of stiffened your core. Mm -hmm. We've seen that over the years. You have been a strong advocate for women. You've been an advocate for survivors of sexual assault in the military. And you were the first member of Congress to step up and say that President Trump should be removed from office. At this point, when you look back on your career, are there moments that you say, this is the thing I'm most proud of? That's a hard question to answer. I, I'm most proud of the fact that um, I've been able to serve my constituents. Um, I think taking on the military, taking on the Pentagon, and having cases of sexual assault and sexual harassment taken out of the chain of command mm -hmm. was a big step. Uh, making Congress more responsive so that if in fact there's sexual harassment going on by members of Congress, that the uh, survivors, the staff members, the fellows, the interns, would be protected was another issue that I took on. Uh, making sure that pediatric cancer was being researched at more levels than had historically been. I mean, there was only about 1% of the NIH budget that was being spent on pediatric cancer. We've now raised it to 8%. So many of those issues, I think, um, have seen the light of day because we've put a spotlight on them. What about regrets? Regrets. I think my biggest regret as I'm leaving office is realizing that this power is um, kind of seeping out of me now. And I'm not going to be able to you know, call up an agency and say, um, give me a briefing on this, or ask the General Accountability Office to do a study on a certain issue. And so I feel that maybe I could have used that power even more effectively than I did. Mm. And so that's probably my biggest regret. Um, I guess finally the Equal Rights Amendment. Mm. Um, trying to get that passed when we're the only industrialized country in the world that doesn't have an Equal Rights Amendment in our Constitution, in our written Constitution. And we came close to striking the deadline. We got it out of the House. It's never been taken up in the Senate. That's probably another disappointment something for the next generation to move forward exactly, with. Exactly, and I hope that they will, and I'm confident that they will. Tell us about what's next for you. You're coming home, and you are going to be starting a new foundation. Right, I'm um, doing what uh, John Lewis said, I'm making good trouble. And what I'm starting is a foundation, first for San Mateo County, but hopefully we'll see it replicated around the Bay Area. Um, we have, um, we're the fourth richest county in the country, and yet we have 23,000 children living below the poverty level, which is a family of four living on $27,000 a year. Wow. We have 2,300 kids that are homeless or nearly homeless. We have a domestic violence, which has jumped 
We've had the highest increase in food stamps uh, in the state. And yet those who um, can give and who do give, the 20 billionaires that live in San Mateo County, the 5,000 millionaires, most of their giving is nationally or internationally. But hiding in plain sight are those among us that need our help. So you're hoping to funnel that money to local needs? Correct. All right. Congress Member Jackie Spear, thank you for being here with us today, and best of luck in your next steps. Thank you, Priya. As holiday lights begin to pop up across our Bay Area neighborhoods, the city of San Francisco joined the festivities this week. Tonight's Something Beautiful is the Civic Center tree lighting event, complete with carols, a dancing Christmas tree, a toy drive, and even a few snowflakes. And that's the end of our show for tonight. Join us next Friday when we talk to Oakland Mayor Libby Schaff. She's stepping down from the office that she's held since 2015. If you'd like to suggest questions for Mayor Schaff, you can by emailing us at knr at kqed.org. You can also find KQED Newsroom online or on Twitter. And you can always reach me on social media at Priya D. Clemens. Thank you so much for joining us. We will see you right back here next Friday night. Have a great weekend.